So I'm very excited to speak with you because Perry, I know a lot of people, obviously they know you from Jane's Addiction and they know you from Porno for Pyros, but I grew up in Los Angeles. So I know that your, you know, your music career started with Psycom in LA and I know that it's gone in all sorts of directions. And this new box that you have incorporates stuff that happened before Jane's, concurrently after, it's all the stuff that happened outside of that. And yeah. it's kind of an unusual thing to do. And it's pretty extensive. I mean, we're talking about like 68 tracks. It's enough for a box set. Yeah, so sure. the obvious first question is, what made you want to put this all in its own box as, as a comprehensive thing? Well, you know, the, I, I think the, the best answer I could give you is that I had music all over, all over the universe. You know, I had porno for pyro stuff and I had Psycom stuff and I had solo work that I had done, song yet to be sung. And of course, Jane's Addiction. But, but basically I had all these tracks floating around as if they were, you know, comets and stars. And um, now today with the internet, you can you can type my name in and get all those songs all those you know tracks i wanted them in one place you type my name in and there's my body of work mm -hmm. and that's that's the simplest answer for you um it's it's really exciting because in some cases uh, as an example we'll use um satellite party this beautiful song, uh, this beautiful record, Satellite Party, was originally put out by, I believe, Columbia or, or Sony. It was Sony. Anyway, they were going through all kind of uh, changeovers. You know, uh, they were, you know, the, letting go of their president, letting go of their entire. Uh, in our department, their promotional department, they were a mess. They were a mess. <laughs> and there was little old Perry just trying to make great music. It was like a family that was breaking up. You know, it was like, yeah, that's exactly what it was like. It was like having a, a screwed up family and you're a teenager, you know, you, you, you're growing up, but then your mom and your dad are are breaking up and so you end up nine times out of 10, uh, it, it with a person's mind, you know, because uh, who's now going to promote the, the, the record? Ends up nobody. So mm -hmm. I decided, listen, I worked so hard on this music. Give me the damn music back. And so I literally bought the record back from those guys. And I waited. So now with the internet, you know, people can go to Spotify and look up and, you know, if you type in Perry Farrell, you can see, you know, Jane's addiction stuff and porno for pyro stuff, but you couldn't find the satellite party because mm -hmm. I, because I decided, no, I'm going to honor this music the right time when the time comes. And so I met up with last man. They uh, were not only, uh, my friends from way back, uh, you know, Ian Jenkinson was a friend from way back when he was working with, um, it was either, I think it was NME Magazine. Um, he voted, he, he had uh, Jane's Addiction vote, voted to be the Godlike Genius Award. They Wait, I went, I went to that, the one that was at the yeah. LA. I was there. Yeah, it was amazing. The elephant came down the street. Yeah. yeah. So I, that's when we really met up Ian Jenkinson, who I've known for forever. But anyway, uh, it's it's a different world, the music industry, completely different world. You know, now distribution is done for the most part online. Uh, as we know, you know, people don't buy much vinyl or they weren't buy, buying vinyl much anymore. They weren't buying CDs much anymore. Um, you know, they're basically downloading it either for nothing or they'd go on Spotify. So everything's changing around. And uh, so I thought now would be the perfect time to 
reintroduce the world to satellite party. In fact, I just grabbed everything, you know, mm -hmm. songs that we did for, there was a song we did for um, a television show. And the show wasn't that great, but the song was really great. It, the song's called Nasty Little Purr. And it was written by <laughs> a friend, uh, ex friend of mine who just like, I don't know, I'll tell you a creepy story about the song Nasty Little Purr. So this guy who was my friend, um, one day he, he said, hey, check out this porn, you know? I'm not really big on porn. I don't know if you are, it's fine. Oh, I mean, you do have a band I called do. Porno for Pyro, so yeah, I guess maybe I know. people would think you were, but go on. But, but it's Porno for Pyros. Mm. I'm into explosions. <laughs> Fair point. I'm just, not, I'm just not into exploiting poor teenage girls that can't get a job and their dad molested them and yeah, now yeah. they're stuck at Jumbo's clown room. Like mm -hmm. that stuff makes me sad. Yeah. Honestly, I, I just me too. can't get into it. Mm -hmm. But I can get into fireworks, explosions, and all that stuff. But anyway, so, um, the song Nasty Little Perv is part of the box set. And my, this ex friend of mine tells me, hey, check out this porn. And as I'm looking at it, it looks strangely like my wife. It wasn't, it wasn't Etty, but it kind of looked like her. Mm -hmm. And it gave me the creeps and it kind of made me think like, do you, are you showing this to me? Cause you think it looks like Etty. Anyway, he sucks, but the song's <laughs> really cool. Nasty little perf, check it out. It's it's song number sixty eight or sixty nine, I believe. I'm that kidding. wasn't the guy from uh, Married to Rock, was it? I'm not going to tell you who it was. <laughs> but it, I used to watch Married to Rock. I loved that show. I, yeah. And there was a there was a moment with a friend who was crossing the line with your wife in that show. It was oh. so I was curious if it was that guy, but yeah, I'm not going to say who it was because I don't want to destroy their career. But, <laughs> <laughs> but like, um. Anyway, the guitar work was so badass, and I, we still to this day work together. Nick, Nick Mayberry, my dear, uh, he's the guitar player for the Kind Heaven Orchestra still to this day. And what I loved about his guitar work was, I have been looking for and still continue to look for musicians, real musicians that can not only rock out and you know deliver blue you know riff rock blues licks but also understand how to how to make a guitar make really strange sounds with electronics and software and pedals and nick is not only an amazing uh, string instrumentalist but he also can come up with the craziest things using, you know, synthesizer uh, elements to, to you know, uh, software packages. Um, and so there you go. <laughs> so was this look back with this huge box set with the 68 tracks, was this at all inspired 69, by 69? 69. Okay, yeah. even better. But was it inspired by the fact that you turned 60 I believe last year or a couple years ago, you were you were tweeting it sometimes, sort of kind of taking stock, feeling a bit introspective. It was like almost like a surreal moment for you, not necessarily in a bad way, but just right. like, oh my God, I'm 60 kind of thing. Did that yeah. make you want to go like, okay, I want to like tell the whole story. Get my together. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, make I gotta get my together. So where is that song? Where, you know, where is that? Where's that? Man, do you remember that other song that we did? I mean, I basically, my day is, I never have a bad day because I'm always writing music. So at the end of that day, I've got something to show for it. Some, some new song that I just can't wait to finish so I can play it for people and, and watch their response and, um, you know, get things off my chest and, uh, I get to work with people that I just so enjoy um, being around. You know, musicians, we're, we're a good bunch. We're a happy bunch. We're, a, um, you know, we're not prejudiced. We're very open-minded people. And so I love getting together with, with my friends, the musicians, and writing new, new uh, I'm even writing with my children now. 
Oh, cool. Oh, are yeah, they are they musicians? All of them? Yeah, yeah. I wrote a great song with my son um, last night. Un, un, yeah, unconditional love. You want to hear what you want to hear a little bit about the song? Yes. Okay. So my son has run now. He you know he started out on bass when the when COVID hit. He uh, just picked up his instrument. I mean, oh, we've got instruments all over the house. And my other son picked up the guitar. So as a dad, it is the greatest feeling in the world to be in your room and you hear different, you know, beats and uh, parts and grooves, verses and choruses coming from different rooms in the house. Um, we have a dear friend of ours, uh, Soleil Moonfry. And um, so this is about the song. So we we love Soleil and we sent her, or Etty really sent her uh, flowers, sent her a bunch of uh, roses. For some reason, the people forgot to write. We told them what to write for the card, <laughs> but, but they left the name off of it. Oh. And we didn't know. And so for months, Etty has almost been brought to tears because Soleil never thanked her. She never said, oh, I got the flowers. You know, we called to see, did we ever, did you ever, you know, deliver the flowers? And the company's like, of course we delivered the flowers months ago. And so we're, we're we couldn't understand why she wouldn't thank us, you know? Anyway, three nights ago, she, she calls, um, up just to say she loves us she loves us so then we go Soleil did you like the flowers and she's like ah you're the guys who sent me the flowers she goes you have no idea how those flowers changed my life I have been wondering and wondering and asking everybody that I know did you send me those flowers anyway she said it put her on a journey. She, her journey was like, who admires me so much that they sent me these flowers? And she, she couldn't figure it out. Anyway, she said, and I go, she goes, because I got to know who sent it to you. I wondered and I wondered because it, 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 it got me to wondering who cared enough about me to send me those flowers I, you know, they didn't know if it was my birthday. They didn't know if it was an anniversary. They just sent me flowers. And I go, unrequited love, right? <laughs> you, you just wanted to know who loved you that much. She goes, exactly. So my son was writing this badass riff. And I said to Hezron, I go, you can't use that riff for anybody but me. I've got a song for you. It's called Unrequited Love. Uh, um, yeah, uh, um, unconditional, love. unconditional love, unconditional love. So I've got all the lyrics. I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna sing them all to you now. But okay. anyway, I've got this song coming called Unconditional Love. It's a great subject, right? And that's how we do it around here. We're just writing, writing, you know, um, we take our dogs out for a walk. We're writing, we're singing, looking forward to the next gig. Do you ever look at your life now, which seems like such a happy, you know, life filled with contentment, you know, family man, husband, lovely home, making music with your kids. Do you ever look at, at now and, you know, you're, like I said, you just turned 60 and go, wow, this is not like, is this the life you envisioned that you would be at, you know, as you got older? Because, yeah. you know, you had some dark times and some crazy yeah. times, like lots of rock stars. Yeah. No, never. So uh recently you know um the, I, i've been watching there's this great uh station that does it's just all rock i think it's called axios axion axis yeah axis tv axis mm -hmm. yeah so um that's a good station you should you should watch it sometimes they've got documentaries on people's lives the breaking up mm. our friend sarah runs it now and she's she's a powerhouse and um, she's got great ideas. And so we watch the show. Anyway, um, I talk an awful lot to my kids about my early days because 
now they're becoming musicians and they're like having problems with their band members. And Dad, did you ever have problems with your band members? <laughs> oh boy, did I, you know, like I, I said to him, I said, listen, man, my first band, they all, they all broke up on me. Like they just didn't want to play with me anymore. Uh, Psycom, my bass player for Psycom literally just like just quit because he couldn't stand me. Like rather than me, me leaving the, he, he just said this, I can't work with this guy. Mm -hmm. I said, and I, so I told my son, I said, you're going to go through, I said, just look at it like this. You're a musician, son. I said, you know, you're going to go through times when you can't stand each other. There's a lot of egos involved always. You know, and you'll never really know why a person's not going to like you. Whatever they tell you, that's not the reason. There's something else and it's deeper. So it's so deep that they're not going to let, they can't even get, they can't even tell you about it. But, and I say, you know, you're going to go through periods when your, your band's going to, you know, going to hate you and they're going to want to break up and they're going to, uh, have all kind of reasons why, and then you're gonna have all kind of reasons why. And um, I said, but here's the here's the thing. I said the world needs music. The mm -hmm. world needs great musicians. I said so. You no matter what, you gotta hang in there. You don't have to be in a band. You can be a solo artist. And my son said, No, I don't want to be a solo <laughs> artist. Solo solo artists suck. I want to be in a band. And I said, you know, I had the same exact you know, notion when I was your age. I didn't want to be a solo artist. I wanted to be in a band. I want to be in the greatest band, like the Beatles and the Stones, you know? Well, there are some people that would absolutely say you were. And since you oh, brought up this subject, I mean, you know, yeah. you know how much, how important Jane's addiction were to the history of everything. And since you brought up the subject, it's kind of a loaded question, but I obviously you guys broke up in 1991, which was a really important year for alternative rock. You know, Nirvana broke through. You did the first Lollapalooza, but I feel like you made a huge mark. But you broke up pretty. Some people would argue basically right at the peak of, you know, just as you were. You could have. I, I think Nirvana get a lot of credit for the alternative rock explosion of the 90s, and and rightfully so. But I think Jane's addiction need that. Uh, those accolades and that credit as well and I'm wondering if you think in the history of rock if you if people realize that that how much Jane's Addiction before Nirvana were big Jane's Addiction were moving that needle on MTV and of course Lollapalooza was a very big deal but thank you well but you know what uh that kind of stuff doesn't matter that much to me I know that sounds funny but but hear me out mm -hmm. so you know, I feel I left just at the right time. I was, uh, I was in it for the fun, for the excitement, uh, for the art. Um, I, I didn't like, I don't like pop music. Um, you know, and everything that goes with pop, it bores me, it sucks, it's sell out. Um, you know, it's good if you want to make a lot of money and that's, it's nice if you make a lot of money, but more important to me is the kicks and more important to me is, um, freedom. Mm -hmm. And when you, you know, you, you become a pop sensation, well, first of all, also, you know, Pop usually doesn't last all that long. I'm in it for the long run. To me, life is not a is not a sprint. It's a marathon, and so I feel like uh, I'm doing better than ever. And my life it really it really is in every aspect of my life is better than it was ever. Um, you know, my family we all love each other get along better, we're more unified. Uh, the music that I get to make, I get to make music with uh, people that, I mean, 
you know, think of the odds. When you first start a band, you only have people that are around at that time that are at a certain age, right? Because a guy who's uh, in his 20s kind of wants to be in a band with, with other guys in their 20s. Um, so you've got a certain pool of people to, to draw from. They've got to also not be in a band. They also have to be kind of like, like the music that you like. And um, they got to be, um, you know, there's a lot of variables when it comes to putting together a group. I feel that today, uh, it, it, again, I say it, it's a very, very different world. Mm -hmm. If my son wanted to, he could be in music his entire life. He could be in a band for a while if he wants. He could branch off and start making music. Um, let me get onto what I'm doing. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about rather than you know, talk about what my son could be doing. I'm gonna tell you what I am doing. Yeah. And he could do it and other musicians could do it too. I still have my lovely group, Jane's Addiction. And I still would love to make uh, music with them live. I could do that a couple of times a year. Um, could still get together with them and write a couple of tracks. But I don't need to, I don't need to go, get in a studio and spend uh, half a million to a million dollars anymore. Um, I don't have to put up with their bull if, if they're uh, pissing me off and, uh, you know, uh, arguing over who got how many shots in the video and uh, what song should be on there and how much they should be getting for publishing and how much, uh, you know, uh, uh, how, how much money we're making and we better take that gig because we could be making so much money, but it's a, it's a sellout gig and I don't want to be playing with that group because I think they suck and it's beneath us. You know, you get into all these petty, petty fights with, with, with your group when you're growing up and you're, you know, you're immature, but fame gets thrown on you and it's almost, it's almost impossible to handle properly. I, I, I really couldn't tell you of one group that I could think of that, that handled fame just perfectly, did it just right. I mean, look at the Beatles, right? The Beatles are about the best group you could think of. Look how they handled fame, you know? Oh, At the oh, end, they hated each other. So you can't expect any less. If you're gonna be the Beatles and you're gonna act that way, what are you gonna expect from Jane's Addiction? You know what I mean? You got drugs there, you got girls there, you got money there, you have a changing industry, I want to just be free to write incredible music. I don't care if K-Rock doesn't like it. They can f off. I love that about today, you know? I just make music that I think is going to be compelling and it's going to it's going to make you ima you know, imagine and think thoughts that are going to be new thoughts and they're going to be intelligent thoughts and and um, when you have a party, I'm gonna rock your party. And it's gonna, and it's gonna be one of those kind of uh, moments where you're gonna just wanna put your arms around that stranger who you just met across the room. And that's the kind of music that I wanna make at a moment. I also wanna turn around and what I call a political protest folk music. I wanna write songs that are, um, that talk deeper thoughts. They might be more serious thoughts, but they're not, they're not gonna make you wanna f but they are gonna make you wanna change the world and, and uh, you know, vote some guy out of office and bring in the right guy. And all these things, that's what I mean by freedom. I wanna have the freedom to make the art and make the music that I want. I don't wanna argue about it. I don't want to get into a, uh, you know, an argument and and uh, in a bad mood about it. And so what I do now is I collaborate. I have a beautiful long list of people I want to collaborate with. 
I probably won't even get to it before I die. But I can tell you, there's a lot of people I want to write with and I want to make music with. I want to I want to still go out there and travel around the world. And I want to play music for people in India and the Ukraine and Cuba and the and the Yukon. And you know, and I wanna and I wanna experience their music and their culture. I wanna, I wanna have the world. I want to create tourism, you know. I want the world to to become friends and and love each other again, and then put on parties, and um, that's where I, that's what I'm up for. You're such a positive person, so I think you've probably answered the question. But it doesn't seem like you have any backward-looking things where you think, oh if maybe Jane's addiction hadn't broken up for those seven or eight years in 91, maybe if we just stuck around to like 94 or whatever and kind of, you know, what would have happened? It doesn't seem like you have, you don't seem like a man who lives with any regrets at all, to be honest. My only, my only regrets are that I partied so much. I, I could have partied less and got more work done, more songs done. Mm. And that's that's my only regret is that I um I, I I wish I would have had more productivity when it comes to my art, but I sure had fun and I sure had wild times, and so I guess you know uh, I I don't regret those new moments uh uh-uh, not for a second. You're working on a memoir, aren't you? Well, I I just started writing. Um, I basically have lots of pictures laying around and uh, what I like to do is I like to just tell the story of that moment in time through picture. And so, yes, in the box set is, uh, I guess you call it memoirs. I uh, thought you were writing an autobiography. Is that not the case? Well, it's like a proper one, like a text a one. proper one. What will probably happen is enough of those the, the the book that I'm talking about, it's a small book. It's mostly picture, a lot less word, a lot of picture. But I have so many pictures, by the end of my life, it'll turn into a killer memoir. But but I'm not I'm not exactly uh, you know, I'm a little I'm a little reserved to to, to tell you everything about my life. Some of it's downright embarrassing, and I've got kids now, and even oh. though I, I'm not a, exactly ashamed, but I, I almost don't want to, I don't want to set my children on a, on a wrong course because they think, well, you did it, and you yeah. know. Yeah, I bet there's a lot of rock stars who are parents now who grapple with that you know, how much they want their kids to find out about. Yeah, they know. don't need to know it all about me. They they go out and live their life. My son already ran away from home twice. He just got back. And, um, you know, I was mad at him a little bit, but then I'm thinking to myself, well, damn, I ran away from home too. So mm-hmm. uh, I understand why he did it, but I just don't need to encourage him by telling him some of the wild <laughs> I did because... You know, I, I'm, I, well. I'm honestly scared. It's, it, it's scary out there, man. I don't, I don't want my kid getting, uh, put, getting into to the wrong situation, hanging around with the wrong people. But at the same time, I don't know how to say this. I do want him to go out there and experience a wild life because he's a musician. And musicians, there's a different, I I think that there's different boundaries. Musicians have to have the right to experience wild things like, you know, absinthe or LSD or mushrooms or, I think that uh, for, for a musician, it is more permissible to uh, experience those kinds of things. Um, 
mind expanse, mind expansive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the best songs are written about the wild times and and uh, and living through the wild times, right? Uh, as again, as I say, as a musicians, you have a different license. In fact, in fact, I truly believe that there ought to be a license that you get that uh, if you are a musician, you have to take a certain course and that gives you a license to experience things. I mean, think what the art world would be without it absent. What, what would Salvador Dali, uh, what would he, you know, what would his paintings look like? What would uh, music sound like if the Grateful Dead hadn't dropped acid? Good point. Yeah. How old is your son, the one you're talking about, that you're were concerned about him, you, the one you, about, you were saying you well, wanted to experience life, but not? One's 16, one eight, one's 18. And they're really good kids. Mm -hmm. They really love music. And like I say, I, 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 I'm the last guy in line to tell them that they can't do something. But I, but I find that uh, the most screwed up people aren't the guys that are, uh, Ex experimenting it's the ones that are are told by their parents that they can't experiment mm -hmm. and held back from uh experiencing life those are the kids that usually end up the most screwed up i think so true it's totally true well since we were talking about 1991 and you were talking about bringing parties to the world and stuff i do we do have the anniversary of Lollapalooza, the first one coming up in july and um, I think now when we see all the festivals that are happening, all the big festivals, you know, Coachella being the biggest one in America, we don't pro probably younger people, it's not, they don't realize what a big deal was that you had people like Ice-T and Susie and the Banshees, you know, on the same bill along with Jane's Addiction, along with Rollins Band and Living Color. Like, can what are your memories of like when that tour first kicked off, there must have been people who were telling you that it was like going to fail or that it was a crazy idea. No, people wouldn't tell me that to my face. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I think they were a little bit intimidated to tell me that. Okay, good. Because because I was making them a lot of money too, you know. So they didn't oh, want to tell mm. me. They 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 looked at me like the 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 goose that kept on laying golden eggs, you know? Uh, and and you know why? Probably because I had that sense of, man, let's do this. It's wild and it's gonna be fun and we're gonna just have the best time and it's and it's never been done before. So let's let's do it. And I still have that attitude. I'm working on a new project right now I can't tell you because I haven't signed on the dotted line, but I can promise you it's going to be yet another wild party that, I, that I'm putting together. And um, this time next year, uh, you'll know about it. Still have Lollapalooza out there. You know, we want to get into to new countries. We want to keep going um, and meeting, uh, you know, new cultures and new new countries and bringing uh, contemporary music you know I, I i love i love putting musicians together and and cultures together i think that is like you know we've had approximately mankind has had approximately 5000 years to uh, to get the together you know to be at peace, right? But it seems like we can't ever quite get there. And I think it's because we keep on waiting for poli people like politicians to do all the work. I think we gotta, we gotta wake up and realize we're the ones that can affect peace. If we want peace, these politicians do whatever they think will get them elected. If, if they see that everybody wants peace, Politicians, the first guy is going to be going peace, 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 right? Because they want to get elected. They just, they're just, you know, a reflection of us. I think now is time that we do want peace 
because we're so bored sitting in our house. We want to just get outside. We want to listen to music. We want to sing and dance. We want to go and visit countries again. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the musician and the entertainer, we're going to be more important than ever to getting this world back and, and you know, bringing this world, you know, um, everybody's afraid now and nobody knows what to do and they don't know where we're going. And I'm here to tell you that I know where we're going. We're going towards cooperation and, uh, and we've, had, we've had a good year to sit and think about things. How can we make this world a better place? That's what I think about every morning. And, and I think the way to get it back is the same way that um, in the 1940s, we were coming out of the Great Depression. And how we got out of that Great Depression was we, we did bold moves. I remember um, Howard Hughes, I think it was, he put together this giant ship, the Spruce Goose, and it was gonna go around the world, you know, and um, it was like the biggest, biggest airplane at that time. It was a marvel. And everybody wanted to see that Spruce Goose, and that Spruce Goose, and it ended up to be a, uh, a really um, a bad idea. It was too heavy and never really, did what it was it intended to do but the point is it was a marvel and i think that when we get the pandemic under control people are going to want to get outside again people are going to get together and and i'm going to be there with my friends the musicians and we're going to party everybody out new songs and the parties are going to be special and we're gonna see each other again out in the open air. We're not gonna be afraid of each other. And it's coming. It's not, not that far. I'm very curious to find out what you got, what you got playing. Cause well, I'm ready, I'm ready to get what, out of the house and do something fun. What, I'm, what we're gonna do is gonna blow your mind. I wanna drive tourism. I wanna be a goodwill ambassador and you know, um, bring all the musicians, all the entertainers that we can, get together with and I and I want to have uh, I, I do I want to have like um, peace gatherings where we bring in uh, you know uh, bring in uh, all, all the, the the spiritual leaders and have them all wouldn't it be cool to bring the spiritual leaders together and everybody smoking peace pipe you know we yeah, yeah. out a bong with some great weed <laughs> <laughs> and imams and rabbis and priests and uh, you know all these spiritual leaders are, are smoking peace pipe and and talking about uh how they can you know help their community help the poor it's so possible i mean right now i don't know things seem up if if you look at it through a certain small little lens but if you look at it through a big, beautiful lens, it gives us a chance, a real purpose in life. I really feel that there's going to be a purpose in life, certainly for me, because you know I'm going to write songs for everybody, and you're gonna, you're gonna, you know, broadcast those songs. Hell yeah! And, Hell yeah! Well, you are a goodwill ambassador. Oh, this, thank you. Yeah, you are thank brimming you. with positivity. I haven't left my house too much lately, but I enjoyed this virtual chat. It definitely made my day. Hopefully next time it will be in person somewhere in someplace full of glitz and glamour. Mm -hmm.